What's up, Jaunty? Good to see you again. Long time. You, you know, I got a little treat. Uh, if, if we could start out, could I do a little show and tell? Okay. Check this out. Yeah. Garlic. Pickled garlic and pickled asparagus. Oh my goodness. I want some of that garlic. Send me some. Mm, see the turmeric in there? You know what's actually really great for, for pickling um, is... Uh, should put your recipe. You should put your recipe there. This stuff. And this is basically pickling and salt, spice. Pepper. Yeah. You, that's great. Himalayan salt is one of the best salts you could, you could ever ingest. Probably people know about it. We talk about Celtic sea salt a lot. Himalayan mm. salt... Is similar. Yeah, you know, salt gets a bad rap because it's like minerals. It's it's misunderstood. You know, minerals are misunderstood. Mm. Minerals have a reputation in the world of nutrition for being the most confusing subject of mm. all the nutrients. Mm. Vitamins are pretty straightforward, with some exceptions. There's a few little kind of little tweaks with vitamins, um, and then essential fatty acids. There's a few little tweaks there, but they're basically straightforward. Minerals are totally confusing to people. The body doesn't really use minerals. Mm. When we talk about, and this is why it's such a confusing subject. You look like you're you're cognating on that. You look like the gears I'm are turning. I'm interested what to hear what you're going to say next. Right, right, right. Okay, so here's the deal. And this is why it's so confusing. Mm. Selenium is not a mineral. Mm. Calcium is not a mineral. Okay. Sodium is not a mineral. Right. They're atoms. Mm. They're elements. The body uses elements off the periodic table. Mm. The elements are delivered in minerals. Oh, I see. Right, okay. The minerals are the carrier for the elements, and some minerals are better at releasing their mm. elements than others. Mm. Mm. Plants and bacteria have a way of transforming rock minerals, which don't release their elements very well, into bite-sized, palatable pieces that the body can utilize. Mm. This makes them of a completely different character, plant-derived minerals, which come from bacteria ultimately. This makes them of a different characteristic, totally different characteristic mm. than, uh, than rock minerals. Mm. The reason I brought this up now is because you talk about salt, and salt is also a kind of confusing term because a salt is a chemistry word that refers to two ions, a positive ion and a negative ion stuck together. Mm. So. So, for example, calcium carbonate is technically a salt. A salt. There's lots of different salts. There's lots of different salts. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So when we say salt, right. you know, we're talking sodium chloride. Right, right. We're talking table salt. Mm. But because we don't define our terms, there's a misunderstanding. We think table salt, sodium chloride, is really bad. Mm. Or not at least, at least, if not really bad, at least it has to be controlled. Mm. Sodium chloride is just two elements. What, why would two elements be such a problem, sodium and chloride? Well, it turns out that sodium chloride absorbs water. Mm. And sodium chloride is an incredible tool for the body to increase or decrease right. blood volume. Mm. When you need more blood volume, such as when you're under stress, mm. your body will retain more salt. So you hold on to water, retains the volume. But the doctor's medical model thinks mm. that that's a bad thing if you have high blood pressure mm. because they increase the blood pressure. Mm. So what they tell you is to go on a low salt diet, completely right. not understanding that salt is tightly regulated in the body yeah. hormonally, tightly. Mm. It's very difficult to like ingest lots uh, mm. or incredible amount of salt. You would, right. you know, food these days is disguised, so we get more than we should, in the sense that we don't really know where we're getting salt. The combination mm. sugar disguises salt, so lots of foods have salt in them, so that they can put lots more sugar in it. Mm, right, right. Right. You can't taste the salt when you have the sugar. So there's a lot of foods like ketchup and processed foods right. that have salt in them, mm. have lots more salt than ordinarily you would be able to ingest. Mm. But unless you have severe kidney problems, which a lot of people have kidney problems, or you have uh, some kind of adrenal issue, the body controls salt levels really well. And you need salt because we're under constant stress. So salt is one of the, a tool that the body uses to manipulate blood flow. Mm. So it, it wants to have salt present so that when we're under stress, we can get more salt into the, into the uh, bloodstream to get more blood, more volume. Mm. Uh, this is why if you're under stress, which everybody is, you need more salt. Right, right. 
This is why people crave salt. In fact, yeah. you'll find if you do a little bit of salt first thing in the morning, if you've been under duress or you didn't get a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. or if you saw in the middle of the day when you're under a lot of stress, if you put a little bit of Celtic sea salt, and I'll tell you about that, you brought up Himalayan salt. Mm -hmm. So Celtic sea salt, if you put a little bit of Celtic sea salt in water and stir it around and sip on it, maybe a quarter teaspoonful to a glass of water or something like that, or a teaspoon to a glass of water, mm -hmm. and sip on it very slowly, that little that that salt water will taste so delicious to you. It will taste like the most delicious beverage you ever had in your life. The first right. sip, it'll right. be so delicious. And then the second sip, less and less and less, and then you'll know you've had enough salt. Mm -hmm. It's a great way for, to help the body handle stress. So this is all to say that we have a lot of misunderstandings about salt. We have a lot of misunderstandings about electrolytes. We have a lot of misunderstanding about minerals. And it doesn't serve us in terms of how we handle our, do our, handle our nutrition business. So when it comes to salt, you need all the elements. And the elements, if you do Celtic sea salt or Himalayan salt, you're going to get way more elements, 70 elements, 78 elements. You're going to get a huge amount of elements mm. compared to sodium and chloride right. if you get right? With, exactly. With, with, with some iodine, usually. With they some add iodine. That. Thank God they add that, but you know. It's a magnet, you know, some kind of flow agent, whatever they right. use to help improve the flow. But basically, you're, not, you're getting like two, two elements, right, with a mm. little bit of the iodine, like right. you said. But compared to Celtic sea salt, you're getting 78 mm. you know, or a Himalayan salt. You're getting 78 elements in those things. You're getting tin. You're getting nickel. You're getting uh, neodymium, and you're getting mm. iodine, and you're getting calcium and magnesium. You're getting all of these wonderful elements, not minerals, elements. Right, right. This is one of the neat things about the ocean and about microbes. The ocean and both uh, the ocean and microbe have an ability to separate elements and make them very small. When you have a rock, it's like a whole bunch of complex uh, atoms stuck together. It's a complex of a bunch of atoms stuck together. What mm -hmm. microbes do and what water does is it spreads the atoms along the ch – picture, picture a ball of yarn yeah. versus a long chain. Mm -hmm. Ball of yarn is a big tangled mess. It's hard to get anything out of it. But the bacteria and the ocean water have an ability to take that, uh, take that ball of yarn – and spread it out really thin mm. so the elements are spread out and dispersed and they have lots of active sites, mm. especially uh, when I say active sites, I'm talking about active sites for elect electrical energy, electrons and protons, and they react with water very well. It creates these incredibly active systems, in, uh, uh, atomic systems, mm. element atomic systems compared to the rock minerals, which is basically, those are the minerals that we get as, in supplements. In, in, pre, in prehistoric days, we were, or not prehistoric, but in uh, pre-industrial days, we would get spring water elements. We would get ocean water. We would get uh, um, uh, vegetables, good soil, volcanic soil. That's where we would get our, our elements. Mm -hmm. These days, we get a lot of them from rocks in the sense that there's a, they, there's a lot of uh, you know calcium salt, calcium carbonate, for example, which is kind of like a rock mineral. A lot, there's a lot of places we get our, our, our uh, nutritional supplements for are harder for the body to process. Mm. And by the way, this is where that whole thing about aluminum and uh, sometimes they'll tell you about, oh, did you know there's toxicity, there's heavy metals in the Beyond Tang, Tangerine, right, etc. Right. They're not accounting for the, the, the different nature of those elements. Mm -hmm. Right. Because be, once you understand that there's a diff, there's different ways elements show up, right. you can understand that some elements are going to be non-toxic and some – or you can see the possibility of some elements being non-toxic and some elements being problematic. If it comes complex with a bunch of other stuff, it could be a problem. Now, yeah. this is there, – there are some simple salts that are a problem. Mercury, for example, mercury sulfide mm -hmm. is a very simple a very simple salt that is, is, is super deadly toxic. So there's, there's some, there's some uh, uh, exceptions. But for the most part, what you're looking for is you're looking for when nutrition is pre-digested or pre-broken down uh, elements that are spread apart in a chain so they can mm -hmm. be more reactive, especially with water. There, there's magic that happens when things mix with water. You know how you say water is the universal solvent? You ever hear that the saying that you know, water is the universal solvent? I like to think of it as the universal activator. So if I take hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid, for example, which is a super caustic acid, and I put it on the table here, and it doesn't have any water on it, it's just going to be a powder. Mm. But as soon as I add water to it's that, it's going to start melting to your desk. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> water yeah. activates things. Mm -hmm. Water makes things active. So when you have an ability, when a rock, which is very electrically active on its, you know, relatively electrically active on its own, you know, rocks have a certain electroconductivity, mm. especially. 
crystalline form. If you take a rock and you have it uh, now add water to that rock and have a way for that rock to interact with the water, which is what these microbes are essentially doing, yeah. you have a powerful you have a powerful system, mm. powerful mm. electrical system. There's all kinds of electrical electrical reactions that are induced mm. by the reaction between the water and the elements that were formerly rocks that couldn't do anything. Right. Well, you know, water is one of the things that people always uh, look to in terms of, of life. Water is like uh, um, dice rolls. If, if life is something that happens slightly by chance, uh, yes. I mean, if, if there's two chemicals that are hanging out and there's no so catalyst, they, they no may random. or may not interact. But you add water to any system. If yes. you have water on a planet, a, yes. a bunch of interesting... I mean, water, when it freezes, it floats. That's that's, uh, that's, that's not normal, you know. That's not normal. No, things usually don't float when they freeze. They get mm. they become denser when they freeze. Water gets lighter when it freezes. No, there's some the water bonds. The way water bonds with each other is an, at the molecular level. Mm. It's mm. a very very it's, people get Nobel prizes for understanding hydrogen. It's called hydrogen bonding. Mm. How these little hydrogens connect up with each other to form systems. Mm. Water as a system is like different than the water molecule. An H two O molecule. And it, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting metaphor how things emerge out of smaller things that have nothing to do with the bigger thing. Mm. Like a beehive is its own system. The bee doesn't even know what the heck's going on. It's just uh, right. a yeah. And somehow forms a beehive. These are emergent systems, they call them. Mm. How does water come out of H2O? The H2O molecule isn't wet. You know, somehow something <laughs> happens, some kind of magic thing happens when all of these water molecules come together right. and they water and and water is really a very mysterious substance in a lot of ways mm. there's actually you know there's three we, we used to think of when we were growing up anyway when i was growing up three states of water right mm. what are the three states of water yeah it's a liquid solid and gas right but did you know there's a fourth state of water uh, this is not, not i'm not being facetious i'm being literally scientific i'm, I'm really interested in other states of matter please tell me about it fourth state of water you ready mm -hmm. it's called magic water Mm. Okay, I call it, I call it magic water, but scientists call it structured water. Oh right, or, or they call it easy water, easy water, exclusion mm. zone water, because mm. when it, it has a way of setting up so that it creates partitions, mm. so it forms little spaces, little uh, little spaces of water and not water, water and not water, water and not water forms compartments, mm. Mm. and these compartments are the end result of a crystalline kind of setup. Yeah. And this is a this uh, easy water exclusion zone water is crystalline water, mm. and it's the end result of interactions between water, protein, connective tissue in the body specifically, and elements. And these things all get together, and they form these systems that are get ready for this. I know you'll love this. The geek in you will love this. <laughs> <laughs> it forms. <laughs> yeah, I hope we're not getting too geeky here. Let's do it. <laughs> all right, let's do it. <laughs> it forms crystalline water, like crystals, mm -hmm. that function as a superconductor. Mm. Not a conductor, a superconductor, which means no resistance. Mm -hmm. Superconduction is when, when energy is transferred with no resistance. So you get instantaneous messaging mm. in the body via the crystalline water superconducting system. Right, it's set up with no, there's no resistance. Right. No, that's what a superconductor is. So right. scientists are working on superconductors. They're trying to get play, uh, trains to superconduct and superconducting so magnets. Makes a great things. magnet, yeah. Great. For, they can do incredible things with these things. The mm. body figured it out. Long the time ago. Before, a long time ago. <laughs> right. Right? The cellular, the, the body. I'm reading a book now called Wetware. Mm. It's, like, it's like software and hardware and firmware. Now they got wetware. It's mm. biological systems, right. biological computing systems, high tech. And I mean, this is the, the body is set up to be as high tech as you could possibly want a system to be. Mm. Like we could in 10,000 years, in 20,000 years, in 100,000 years, we probably wouldn't be able to get the kind of uh, technology and nanotechnology right. and intelligence right. and responsiveness and mm. adaptability. We could never do that. That's from a technology – like. A million years in the future, yeah. maybe maybe millions of years in the future, right? You know, Ben, the other day you posted something on Facebook, uh, an article talking about how there's folks, um, the, the, the technology of um, machine 
computer brain interface has advanced dramatically. Is that and amazing? There's a and bunch of folks out there, you know, yeah. uh, now, and now there's like a rate of adoption. There are actual cyborgs yeah. walking yeah, around are, today. They actually they're, have been for a while. I've, I've yes. been following this stuff. But yeah. uh, I think I've got a funny feeling that you and I are kindred spirits with regard to this idea. If we just figured out how powerful our bodies actually were. That's true. That's true. Uh, how about our DNA? The storage capacity of our DNA? They're working on DNA computers now. Mm -hmm. They want to use DNA as a storage device because it's not binary, it's quaternary. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah. if, if you square, you square everything, you know? So, I mean, there's a, the storage capacity of DNA is, you know, beyond belief. And mm -hmm. if we could figure out how that's done, they're, they're, they're working on DNA computers. But this is where this book Wetware is talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's other, there's other books. There's this guy named Eric Drexler who talks about writes a lot about molecular, he's from your area somewhere in Silicon Valley. He writes, yeah, he's pretty famous. He, he wrote a book called, uh, I, forgot he, I forgot the name of his classic book is, but it's about nanobots. Mm. He talks about molecular machines, about using molecules as machines. And a molecule, to give you a sense, there are more molecules of water in, in this than there are stars in the known universe. Right, right. Right? So, I mean, you're talking, when you talk about molecule, you're talking about really, really small, but he's talking yeah. about the future in the very not too distant future, programming molecules to do things. Mm. The body's already figured it out. The body is, does it all the time. The body programs molecules to do things. That's right. how the body works. Yeah. It programs them and, it, and it's responsive. It, it constantly processing information and changing accordingly. You know, it's funny people who are freaking out about 5G and AI, guess what? The genie is out of the bottle, man. Yeah. You ain't stopping any of that stuff. Yeah. So we'll adapt, but you're not going to stop it. You used the metaphor of the beehive earlier. Just yeah. bear in mind that we're a bee, and what the we're hive is doing isn't we're necessarily something is that we're even aware of. It's difficult for us to even figure it out. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. It's like the ant mm -hmm. questioning you know, what, what exactly is happening, not realizing that what he's doing is creating an, an ant a, a city. You know, like ant cities are like, they have hundreds of thousands or I don't even know, millions probably yeah. of citizens in them. They never fight. There's no conflict. Mm. They don't have bosses. There's mm. no instruction. They just somehow <laughs> do their thing. And the end result is this elaborate, you know, civilization yeah. with, you know, with architecture and, and ranks and hierarchies and bureaucracies and defense and like all this pretty much like the body the body is the classic emergent system i don't I remember think. these numbers exactly off the top of my head but um in in the united states uh in terms of total weight of uh physical body of organism uh humans would be about 10 cows would be about 50 and ants yeah. would be about 200 wow there's about 20 times as much ant body yeah. Yeah. In in the continental U U.S. as there is human body. That's really interesting. How about the cell? How about the bacteria in our bodies? The mass of bacteria in our bodies. Well, you mentioned that there's actually many more uh, individual cells in our and gut biome right. than in our by physical body. By a factor of ten. Hmm. By a factor of ten.